Welcome to the Modern Indian Identity Series, brought to you by the Center of the American West and made possible by the generosity of Liz Moore, the Vice Chair of the Board of the Center of the American West, and her husband, Tony. Yay! When we wrote the description for this series, we managed to say something pretty close to what we meant, which is not always an everyday experience for human beings trying to express themselves on complicated subjects. <laughs> So I'll now um, present a bit of that description here. 21st century Indian people face a particular and peculiar, peculiar dilemma with history and time. Novelists and filmmakers have had extraordinary success in romanticizing the Western past. And one result is this. In the minds of many non-Indians, the only real Indians are 19th century plains horsemen riding after bison and circling around immigrant wagon trains. This stereotype leaves no room for two crucial cultural facts. First, Indian people in the past and the present made and make their livings in hundreds of different ways, from corn farming to salmon fishing, from the gathering of acorns to the trading of goods, from the production of records to the writing of blogs, and so on. Um, and second, Indian people in our times both carry on ancient cultural traditions and live with familiarity, familiarity and ease in the modern world hoping to make at least a small contribution to the cause of better understanding between Indians and non-Indians, the Center hosts a series of contemporary Indian speakers telling their stories in ways that confirm the compatibility of tradition with innovation. The speakers have a profound tie to their people's past, and they have also adapted with agility and enterprise to the conditions of our times. They have, in other words, triumphed over the stereotype of real Indians as people sequestered and set apart in a lost past. Our speaker tonight, Will Wilson, is a Navajo photographer who attended the University of New Mexico, receiving an MA in photography there. He has been an artist in residence at the School for Advanced Research. Museums of plenty have sought out Mr. Wilson, exhibiting his photographs and also enlisting and sponsoring him in the creation of more photographs. Our good fortune tonight stems from the fact that the Denver Art Museum was one of those museums. Several years ago, Will Wilson took up the historical practice of wet plate photography, the method used by the extremely influential photographer Edward Curtis in the early 20th century. Curtis was the fellow who produced those sepia-toned portraits of Indian people who seemed to be situated in the distant past, striking and often somber people who seemed unlikely to prevail and persist in the modern world. Will Wilson has used Curtis's techniques to make portraits of contemporary Indian people and this extraordinary way of exploring the past and the present became the foundation for his critical indigenous photographic exchange. When Will Wilson excuse me, was in residence at the Denver Art Museum a couple of years ago, the museum invited a motley crew of local people to sit for photographs. And it was a particularly kind act of providence that sent me to Denver to be in Will Wilson's company and company of his camera on the date of April 1st, April Fool's Day. Will Wilson tells the people who pose for him that they can, if they like, bring a cultural artifact with them. Thus, I am the incredibly lucky holder of a tintype version of myself. Dark skin, as, um, as your image is being developed, your skin gets darker. And as I said to Will, um, why my skin is really getting very dark? And he said, I'm indigenizing North America one person at a time. <laughs> so here I am, indigenized um, for the moment. And I will be happy, this is not part of the presentation, but I will have this up here tonight if anyone wants to come see how uh, frozen in time I look. I look, there I am, I'm uh, wearing a fool's hat, and I'm looking haunted and not fully situated in the dynamic world of the 21st century, which is actually how I am. <laughs> uh, Bill Wilson's adventure in time travel is utterly remarkable. I was tempted to call the relationship between Edward Curtis and Will Wilson to refer to it as a Vulcan mind mill, but I am not as literate in Star Trek metaphor and analogy as I should be before making such a remark. To quote him, I am impatient, he's written, with the way that American culture remains enamored of one particular moment in a photographic exchange between Euro-American and Aboriginal American societies, the decades from 1907 to 1930 when Edward Curtis took his photographs. But rather than denounce Curtis and bemoan his continued influence, Will Wilson chose to, quote, resume the documentary mission of Curtis, using Curtis's te photographic techniques to convey a contemporary vision of Native North America 
Will Wilson is an artist whose robust claim on life and whose breathtaking creativity overrules the tired myth of the vanishing Indian. Will Wilson's art has many dimensions besides this cross-cultural and cross-chronological relationship with Edward Curtis. He is a person whose relationship to the world around him is at once tranquil and dynamic. He raises questions and he answers those questions and those answers in turn set off the next round of creative and innovative expression producing an impact on viewers that is at once unsettling and refreshing, a fountain of serious and assumption challenging thought, and also a fountain of delight and pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Gobos. Um, can you guys hear me? No. no. Can you hear me now? Barely. No? Okay. There we go. Okay. Oh, this thing is working. I could talk. Well, no. We got to do We're good now. Um, well, thank you so much, Patty, for that amazing uh, introduction. Um, and thank you for coming out and, and, and participating in this, this evening. Um, I hope that. That we get to <laughs> that we get to like what dialogue, right? Because because that's what my project is all about. It's about like a dialogic process. Um, so the first image here is is an image that um, Ray, Ray Manley photographed um, many years ago, probably '54 or something. And, and, and the, the young girl in the foreground, she's probably nine or ten years old, is my mom, which is like crazy. <laughs> um, and, and in some ways, uh, I think that this is evidence about like, like how, how we've all been time travelers, right? Like, you know, in, in two generations, we've gone from that to, to where we are now, you know. Um, which is remarkable. Um, I'll show you work later in the presentation that my mom are do and, and, and I are doing. Um, and yeah. So Ray Manley, part of this this I don't know, um, trying to create uh, a certain image of, of people, right? Um, and I think within the context of what we've been talking about, um, like exist in an ethnographic present that we all inhabit the same moment. And that's a strange idea, but um, so my, my grandmother and myself in the same um, moment, I think. Um, and so what I'm going to do like during this discussion is talk about like my practice and how I think about photography in relation to Native Americans, right? And, and how we represent ourselves and how we have been represented. So Three brooches. Um, I have a light meter, and my grandmother and her good friend also wearing brooches. Great. So, um, when it came to photography, I think that I was thinking a lot about. Um, documentary and the history of documentary photography and my relationship to it and how I could represent my community in, in that process. Um, and I think very quickly I got frustrated or I was um, I was kind of scared about how I put the images of these folks out into the world, right? So 
everybody <coughs> knows about the, the Hollywood invention of the Native American who doesn't want to be photographed, right? Why don't you want to be photographed? Because? Exactly, yeah, right? That's not specific to Native America. <laughs> Anybody in the world who was like experiencing this indexical register of, of their visage in the universe, like was shocked because it's an amazing thing to see yourself like so well represented in another space, right? Um, we, we have a problem with that because <laughs> um, there's, there's something about being able to control someone's visage, right? Like, you know, I mean, today we talk about, um, what do we talk about? We talk about being black and driving, right? <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> like, you see somebody and, and they are automatically of suspect, right? I think we're dealing with that same reality when we think about photography in this way. Um, so this image in particular is me kind of working through that process. So you know, Native Americans have been photographed and like put within the, I don't know, the confines, the, so this is, this is my family, like, get together, right? <laughs> but it's been archived in a different way. Um, so this, this work um, is work that I did as, a uh, student at the University of New Mexico. Um, this is my MFA thesis. Mm -hmm. And it, it's kind of working through that process, right? Working through the idea of a body in an archive, um, but embracing that notion um, and making beautiful objects around the idea of photography. This is a different work, um, a different series, and it's um, entitled Autoimmune Response. So the idea of autoimmune response is that we are, you know, we are humans that have immune responses to things that exist in the world. Um, and that perhaps Native Americans are a sentinel population in some ways. Um, and that we've been subject to like amazing <coughs> change, right? So economy, like the way that you create food, the way that you sell food, the way that you like exist in an environment um, it, it's been disrupted right um, and so in some ways your immune system responds to that um, but also that response happens um, in a way that's it's like regulatory, like you figure out how to move forward, right? So agency exists within that kind of space, right? So that's where the response comes in, the, in these images. Um, we have this protagonist who exists in this space, um, and he's trying to figure out how to survive, right? And <coughs> After, you know, a little bit of wandering, he finds a uh, hogan, which is a traditional Navajo um, architectural form. And that becomes a laboratory for, for his investigation and his need to survive. 
Um, and then within that context, you know, he's moving forward. So that's what autoimmune response is about. Um, and eventually, in this series, uh, he builds a home because we all need to live in a home in the post apocalyptic universe. Um, <laughs> right? And that home um, eventually becomes a greenhouse. And the greenhouse is a place where uh, indigenous um, food source is created. <coughs> And then it expands, right? So um, the protagonist in this series, the autoimmune response, um, is trying to bring back the world in some ways. Um, but you know, it's not. A, it's not. It's. I don't know. Within this dream is is a real kind of occurrence. Like, I got to shoot these images in the Denver Botanical Garden, which was, you know, this amazing resource to, to create art in. Uh, they invited me to, to bring my hogan to that space. And in that space, I got to shoot these images and cultivate indigenous food species of the region. Right, so he's terraforming in some way. Right, he's bringing back um, the world that needs to be. So a shift um, in my practice. This is a, um, a very large photograph, but it's made of glass, and it's made of a million pixels. So you know the pixels. Right. In this case, it's a three-quarter inch square of glass. Um, and if you replicate it many, many times over a network, you start to build um, giant images of community. Right. So. This is um, a picture of the Barrio Anita mural project, which at that moment was the largest public art project in the history of Tucson, Arizona. Um, and everybody imaged in this mural is from that community. So for example, this is Mr. Val Valenzuela. Um, who is this amazing person in, in the community, and Marriott is very important for Tucson. Um, and he's been teaching Marriott to, to that like, neighborhood for you know, the last 30 years. of the Aztec biograph. Um, and when the neighborhood saw those images, they could only see gang violence, right? So this is what we ended up making, which is more a story about Father Ron, who's this Franciscan -like individual who rallied the community to create this amazing um, the church.
So this is uh, the same process that we did in, in Tucson, but um, in Philadelphia. And this is a work that is sponsored by Lincoln Financial, um, which is, you know, it's a large bank in Philadelphia. And they were interested in, in having us make a work around the idea of Lincoln and perhaps emancipation. But this is what we ended up producing. And it's tile pile 2.0. So the same technology um, to make uh, Navajo rug on a much smaller scale. And this is something that's much closer to home for me. Um, my grandmother wove this rug um, about 40 years ago. And we reproduced it with um, four mil millimeter glass tiles and about 80,000 of them. Um, and we incorporated QR codes. <coughs> when you scan the rugs, it takes you to this. Photograph of a sitter 
Um, in, in the past, it was it was Patty, um, and so I, I always think about it in the context of, of something that I've been thinking or calling relational aesthetics, um, where you sit down and you kind of theorize what it means to have a photograph made of yourself or another person. And I'm using a historic photographic process called wet clay collodion, which it kind of prefigures Curtis in some ways. Um, he did do wet clay, but um, by the time he started his project, which was called you know, the North American Indian something or the archive, um, in 1907, um, gelatin had kind of replaced collodion. And you could make a photograph, go away for a few days, come back, and develop it. With wet clay, you have to do it like in the moment. So you have about 10 minutes from when you make your um, emulsion to um, when you have to you know, develop the, the exposure. Um, but in some ways, um, you know, it's, it, it is about time traveling. Um, this is Joe Horse Capture, who is um, a curator at the National Museum of the American Indian currently. Um, and when I took his photograph, he grabbed my iPad and he said, hey, uh, does that thing work? Is it connected? And I said, yes. And he brought this image. And the image is of his great, great grandfather, uh, Horse Capture, who was photographed by Edward Curtis. Um, and, and he brought that up and he said, I want to be photographed with this image. You know, and, and in that image, um, Horse Capture is holding a rifle to represent that he's a warrior. And in this image, um, Joe is holding the iPod pad to, to kind of evoke the fact that he is, you know, engaged in representation and knowledge. And that's what he does. So that's his kind of way of being a warrior in today's world. Um, so in one way, that image totally encapsulate, encapsulated this, this project. Um, this is Kevin Gover, who is the director of the National Museum of American Indian. And um, that's Carla. And so in this summer, the summer of uh, 2016, I'm going to get a commission to go photograph um, the descendants of the Curtis Portfolio 19 Indians of Oklahoma. And we're going to do this. <laughs> <laughs> so the people are going to be holding the photographs of their ancestors and then they're going to be speaking about what those images mean to them.
happy to entertain any questions. Yeah. Your courts are so awesome. Thank you. The process just works like the game box. Well, the process is made for portraiture. So, I, if you Google web play, it was designed around the idea that, you know, we would make an image of ourselves and of people that we care about um, versus having someone commission, like doing a painting, yada yada. Um, and it became much more accessible to the world, really. Yeah. Were you inspired by any other contemporary artists like uh, Zig Jackson or Sinatra? I love Zig, and I'm having a show with him at the Portland Art Museum um, in February. Mm -hmm. um, kind of off kilter, but Joel Peter Whitkin is somebody who, like, like that's why I'm a photographer of his work. And Hale and I have worked together on a number of projects. Yeah? I was just curious, um, how come you decided to include the scanners into the navigable uh, read uh, Well, uh, you know, if you think about, it, like, um, so, okay, the question was, like, um, how did I think about including the QR codes into Navajo Textile, right? Um, I think that, you know, there's something about the oral and the, the literate and, and, and working kind of between those spaces um, that has also interested me. Um, but, like, the first computers were based on punch cards for uh, Descartes looms. So, like there's a, a nice like relationship between the fact that you know we can access this stuff through a weaving um, and the modern weaving in some ways or modern computing um, is based on weaving it's it's very uh, it's you know it's it's, it's x and y it's, it's Descartian. <laughs> Yeah. The QR code reader can take you to many places. Where do these codes take you to if you use code reader? Well, those take you to um, that specific media. So my mom talking about a two-faced rug um, with her cousin. Um, that's what you were listening to when you watched that video. Um, these will take you to interviews with descendants of Curtis folk, you know, talking about what this image means to them. But a nice merger of technology and history. Yeah. I, don't, I, I think in a lot of ways, a lot of this is very um, simple. <laughs> but that's what makes it beautiful and important. Yeah. Questions. One, do you have any published uh, books of your work? Not yet. Yeah. Okay. And then my second question, uh, in the the rugs, were they individually beaded? Is that how you did the tile? So, you know, there's um there's a commercially available bead loom uh, called Mirix, and I was gonna build my own you know, kind of based on Navajo looms, but I found this thing that existed already. And they, they fully acknowledge that they're kind of sourcing their technology from Navajo. Um, so I use that. Uh, Mirix is some amazing company. And they've been supportive. Yeah? The uh, advertisement has uh, for the, for the evening, has two male images. Oh, yeah. would, you, would you tell us about that? That's such a complaint. okay. So if you have it, if you could put it, I don't it know if I have, have it. it. 
that piece is called How the West is One. Um, but it's me, right? It's me. Um, so the the SWIO, which is the organization that runs the Santa Fe India market, they approached me and they said, "Can you make an image of this necklace?" Which was this beautiful necklace that was a collaboration of thirteen different jewelers. Um, and I said, "Well, if you give me some money to buy." the chemistry for this process, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> and I made this image of myself wearing the necklace. And so that's my Indian self. And then I created my cowboy self, <laughs> kind of in dialogue with, with that person, um, which is very much, you know, I mean, it's a self-portrait in, in many ways. Um, it's about who I am. Thank you know, and it's kind of Well, thank you. <laughs> it is on everybody's program, if you want to look at that. Or it's, just, it's so interesting to have that image on our program and to have you on our program, or presenting our program, presenting really Well, I think it's about the idea that we are one, right? Versus, yeah. you know, that we conquered a people. That we are an actual you know, dialogue with one another. And, and very much, I think that's what, you know, the, the center of the American West is about, right? <laughs> yeah? Um, so I guess in talking about dialogue, how do you feel that your work varies depending on the subject matter? If you're taking pictures of indigenous native people or of yourself or of, you know, the like Patty or me or my yeah. people, whatever, you know? Well, one way that, that I've been kind of theorizing it is, is thinking about relational aesthetics and the fact that, like, I get to bring people into this, like, engagement. And we sit down and we make a photograph. And you really get to think about what it means to make an image of yourself and what it means to have someone take a photograph of you. Um, and, you know, it's a short process. It takes about 30 minutes. but. Um, I, in some ways, it goes back to that adage, you know, or that, that Hollywood fabrication about the fact that Native Americans were, you know, scared about having their soul stolen because, and I, I don't keep the soul, right? So I make a scan of it, and I have a facsimile of it, and I gift that thing back to the person whose image because, you know, on some level, it's like physics, like, a photon bounces off of that person <laughs> and registers and like chemically changes the silver emulsion to create a photograph. And so, I don't know. You know, I mean, that's a sacred object as far, I'm at, as, far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and, and I give that back to them, you know, and I, I hope that people think about that in the process. Um, you know, especially in this digital age when we can all just make images very quickly and amazingly um, that, you know, having gone through that process, it's like special. Well, yeah. you, you force the dialogue even earlier, don't you, by asking your subjects to bring something to the session yeah. that is really, really important to them? Well, when I met Patty, <laughs> she brought this, just her hat. And I thought, oh my God, this is a special person because she's bringing, she's representing herself as a fool. And what does the fool do? They speak truth to power, and 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 they don't have to worry about getting their head chopped off. Um, so, <laughs> you know, I was like, I have the fool in my presence. Like, I get to make an image of the fool. So, um, that was a special thing, I think, to happen. But the things you've said earlier in the day about bringing aesthetics, there it is, there it is. Uh, and that can be seen more closely at, afterwards in a few minutes, but uh, that bringing aesthetics and ethics into the same oh, yeah. process. Yeah. 
So, you know, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's something that I riff on and it's something that I think about and, you know, I've kind of linked myself to Curtis in some ways. Like, I've gotten my caboose hitched to that train in some ways. Because um, there's 280 of these subscription-based volumes that exist in the universe, right? And now they're worth, you know, millions of dollars and institutions want to like, display them and then they would say, okay, but we have to contextualize this. We have to like, look to a native photographer who's working on this idea and, you know, so, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've got, you know, I, I think I've got a lot of work that, that is happily um, in the future. Um, but ever been irritated by Curtis or well, or bad at his legacy maybe more than mad at him or so Curtis um, in volume one he photographed the Yeviche which is the night wave ceremony of Navajo and it's like this nine night like really sacred ceremony that you're not supposed to you know photograph or represent um, and he photographed it in a you know peculiar way. Um, he knew traders that worked in Chinle, which is, you know, kind of the heart of the reservation. Um, and he had them don the garb of different kind of impersonator gods. And that's how he was able to photograph uh, the Yeviche. Right? So that's probably, you know, um, but it wasn't real. Like he didn't get the the actual object. And then some of those people too. And we were talking about this earlier. Like the traders that he got the garb from were these white boys who were actually initiated in the Yebiche ceremony. So I mean, they were part of the community. And and you know, they said, hey, if you want to be part of this idea that we can heal somebody through this process, then join us, you know. And so those folks were photographed um, as Yebiche people. Um, so it's a lie, but it's not. Like, I think like that, that is like particularly like, like it, it's, it's an amazing, Thing that happened. People need to write about it or think about it. <laughs> I, I really, I'm here monopolizing, but I've heard so many things that you've said during the day. But the one thing I really haven't asked you is if you see, you seem to be so effective at and run to refusing oppositions so that the cowboy and the Indian are in a dialogue, they're not in a yeah. shouting match or they're not staring each other down. Do you see? intense, irreconcilable conflict in places? And do you do any of that? Does your art try to take that on? Or do you just keep doing this great stuff of finding that um, contact and connection? I don't know. I think if we continue to <laughs> we're in trouble. You know, it's like the canary in the coal mine idea. Like, we're all in the coal mine. But, like, Navajo folks experienced it first. But, we're, we're all going to experience it, like no matter where we come from, um, one way or another. It's like we're heading towards an apocalypse, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and and uh, I think Indians have been aware of like a balance, you know, and and they understand that that balance is like shifting. But I don't know. That, that's where I come from. Just like when I make this work, I think. I'm yielding to the audience again in a second here, but um, since you are so in the company of this long dead person, do you... Not work? so long dead. He only died in 52. Yeah. <laughs> the year after I was born. Just yesterday, really, when he started. So, um, but, but it's uh, interesting. We did talk a little bit about this, that when Edward Curtis was quite old and was no longer photographing, people wondered where he had gone. 
And so he received communications, and other people received them with the same question, is Edward Curtis still alive? Which is kind of a hurtful thing to have people, or maybe it's a positive thing, but I, I was saying that I get, uh, I'm 64 years old, and I get people saying, haven't you retired? And I have that same sort of, I'm not quite dead yet, as they say in my private that's part of the, you know, like the unearthing of the myth, like he created this mythic space for Indians to exist in, but yet he was driving a car around L.A., like at the end of his career, you know, uh, or when he went to shoot the Osage um, in Colorado, or in Oklahoma, they were, they were some of the richest people in the world because they had oil money and they were here at the Broadmoor you know, chilling out during the summer, drinking martinis, and Curtis is like, Where's the, where are the Osage? I've done much photography of rank and file people. These are more celebrities in a certain way. They are celebrities. I mean, in my mind, I, I think they're celebrities. But, like, when I do the project, it's open to anybody who wants to dialogue about so, can you show us some of your rank and file? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um. While you're just uh, getting that, I myself have a sharp edged, cruel humor, and I think there's something pretty funny about Edward Curtis giving people the impression of the vanishing, dying Indian and then being subject to that himself, the dying, vanishing <laughs> Curtis. That just, I had a process of that just strikes me as funny. And that small of me, I guess, to do. But that uh, does lead to interesting questions, which you might want to come back to at some point about the questions uh, asked earlier about how you will be responded to and understood by artists oh, yeah, in the future. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know, like, this image is an image of the, my mentor at Oberlin College, who was a feminist contemporary art historian, and her husband. So, Patty Smith um, and her husband, and their kids. So, I got to do a, um, a stint up at, you know, the college in, in, in northern New Mexico, or northern New York. But I've, I've taken about 2,000 of these images now. So, you know, she, she, her practice is photographing Native Americans and Native American culture. So, I have to photograph her. You know, it's like kind of turning the lens in some ways. And that's what Zeke Jackson does in his practice, you know. He takes pictures of white people at powwows, taking pictures of Native Americans. <laughs> but so this series is uh, a bunch of weavings that the Denver Art Museum has now. And each one of those goes to uh, my autoimmune response protagonist at the sacred mountain that, that is kind of analogous to this. To, so this is white. And white is Sisney Ginny, which is in southern Colorado near the um, Great Sand Dunes. It's like one of the last 14 years in Colorado. Um, Matt Evans, I think it's no, 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 not Matt Evans. Um, Blanca, yes, thank you. So when you scan that, you see me at Mount Blanca, like walking around with my gas mask. That's Rulon, who's a an amazing dancer, and she has a. Um, Contemporary Native American dance troupe. More questions, please. I'm sorry. Yes, Melanie. Uh, is it okay for us all to take pictures at ceremonies? Are you good with that? Mm. 
That's a good question. Um, so Curtis, he photographed Yevichay, and I'm going to have a, a show at the Portland Art Museum, and they've invited me to use, you know, whatever Curtis images are available, and a number of those images are of Yevichay. So I'm going to put them out there, but I'm going to put a big black, like, box. So you can't see the person. Except for um, Charlie Day and his brother, Sam. Just to kind of bring that notion forward, right? So, like I was saying before, um, Curtis was the first white man that was able to photograph the Yevache, but he wasn't actually there in the winter. He was there in the summer. So there were no Yevaches going on because <laughs> it only happens in the winter. Um, and uh, he got these folks to don the garb and that's, so they were imposters. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, you know, Curtis, I have like deep respect for Curtis because if anybody here can like commit themselves to 20 years of like hard work and give away their life otherwise to shoot photographs of, of people, then you know, that's a powerful thing, I think. Um, but, you know, he's also problematic, and those images are problematic, and I think it's more about the way that we read the images now that is something that we have to think about harder um, than the actual fact that they exist. I'll answer your question. Uh, I found in Rapid City, and they have been having some very successful community community dialogue between the Lakota and the white people of Rapid City because there's been huge events around racist behavior, yeah. put it mildly. Um, but they recently just had a day when they invited people to come and to teach them what the protocol is of powwow and what is acceptable behavior there as a white person and what yeah. is it. I didn't. I wasn't up there, but um, they had some people come to actually learn. As a white person attending a powwow, what what are you, how are you expected? Yeah. You know what is respectful and what is it? And I think that's long overdue in our nation as a whole. I think privilege is a tough thing. You know, like I mean, I I'm half white. You know, but the fact that I'm standing in front of you is because I went to an East Coast boarding school, you know, and I got a great education, and I, I totally understand, like, how to speak in the space, and how to create and, and, and make, you know, discourse within this context, um, and I choose to represent myself as a Native person, you know, at the same time, so, I mean, it's complex, right, it's, it's about contradiction, it's about, like, challenging yourself and you know and I think that that's what those images are ultimately about you know like this guy went out there and he gave his life to this idea of photographing a people before they went through this transition um, and sometimes he you know he went too far <laughs> he photoshopped out like you know clocks or you know things that um, were evidence of the new world, but I don't know. He was he tried. <laughs> Didn't Curtis also tape record the language of many? Yes, yeah. there's like thousands of um, wax cylinder recordings of language there's and of ceremony. Using this yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, he was from that time when people kind of understood themselves as artists and as maybe ethnographers or. You know, they kind of lived in this strange space between, you know, creativity and, 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 and hard knowledge or something. So, yeah, and he made movies too, which is funny because, you know, think about those images in relation to a moving image, you know. Reportedly, <laughs> some of the tribes are using his tapes to help yeah. restore their language among their. Like, yeah, I mean, I. I the whole linkage of my work to Curtis is is strategic, and I honestly don't know that much about Curtis. 
April, when Tim Egan is going to be here. Tim Egan wrote the Long Nights of the Shadow Catcher, a by to Edward Curtis, so you're welcome to come back. And you will be back here in March for a, a period of a week's residency. Yes. Right? I will be here in March for... March 15th. March 15th. Cool. Thank you. Because um, my good, dear friend, Melanie Yossi, who's in the room, who's an amazing printmaker uh, at your campus. <laughs> so I, I uh, just a couple last things to ask. That my understanding is that Zuni had to shut down uh, visitors, not Zuni visitors or not Zuni visitors coming to their ceremonies because they have to give away food as part of the custom to give away food, and there were a slew, of, just a slew of There's white folks coming people. in for food. <laughs> So shouldn't you make art making fun of those people, or, 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 or mocking them, or wait, how does that kind of behavior, um, what do we do about that? There is this amazing collection at the School of American Research in Santa Fe, and it's Zuni pottery, and it's supposedly Zuni pottery that, that is ceremonial and, and, and real, but a trader in um, kind of cahoots with a bunch of ceramic practitioners made these things. And some of them even have like like the X out like comic like when you see a dead like mouse, it's got the comic. So Rockefeller Rockefeller like got sucked into this idea that these were real and that they were able to access these ceremonial objects. And I don't know. I, it's funny, it's, it's like fabricating history or playing with history is a, is a beautiful thing, I think, and that's what this process enables me to do in some ways. And it's a rich, rich history. I mean, um, like I've taken pictures of African Americans, and when they see those images, they think about slavery, you know, because that's when like, so 1850 to 1880, you know, they're thinking about themselves as, you know, property, or, you know, and I mean, what does that mean? Like, and it, it shocked me, and I, I hadn't thought about that, but, but that, that's a cool thing to be able to kind of, like, dialogue with history through the process. Um, do you... What? Yeah. Oh. Well, can you talk a little bit um, because it comes back to the communities that are reclaiming these images of their ancestors and their work? And so I have this wonderful opportunity to dialogue with Curtis next summer. Um, uh, portfolio number 19 is the Indians, or part of that is Indians, the Indians of Oklahoma. So he went and photographed them. And they've identified uh, about 30 um, of the descendants of the people who were actually imaged. And so we're going to go photograph those people with the Curtis image and have them talk about, you know, and then use this process, this lay art process, to, to have them, to kind of give agency, I guess, to, or give voice to the folks about what those images mean to them and their family. Or maybe not. <laughs> maybe they'll just be like, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> or, you know, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. There's something that came up this, this afternoon about technology and I was thinking about, you know, like, I don't think the people who are imaged in those photographs who like around like came around to consent, you know, to say, okay, you can take my picture. Like I don't think that they completely understood how those images could move forward, but I think that the, on some level they probably thought that like I'm gonna be able to speak to somebody in the future. You know, and and I'm gonna tell them my story. And this is why I'm who I am and I'm proud of being, you know, a Native American from Oklahoma. Yeah. So I, I hope that you know we, we get to tap into that. Well, 
speaking uh, to the future and in the future, I've had a few moments during your visit here where I thought about all the really astounding, creative, original artists that I have never met and will never be, and that's partly because some of them went ahead and passed away before the chance came. <coughs> uh, but also, but I just there's just so many occasions where it would have been incredibly interesting to be in the company of somebody with such a level of creativity and, and originality and thought. And so I think in the future that we will be saying, oh, we had that occasion with Bill Wilson here. And well, that thank you. will be a consolation for the times that we were just born too late to meet people. So thank you for when you were born, and thank you for everything <laughs> you've done, and thank you for coming here tonight. <laughs>